How many of you have your coin, your whole armor of God coin? Thank you. Uh, it's mine's in my pocket. So every morning I slip it into my pocket and I go through the armor of God and uh, it's gotten to the point where I can do this in my sleep. But I, I keep learning something about the armor of God the more I rehearse it and the more I do it. And then during the week, I reach in my pocket during the day and it reminds me again, oh, the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, or the gospel of peace. What a gospel, gospel of peace. Then the shield of faith, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, all put on by prayer. Well, it's the last Sunday in August. I'm not telling you something you don't know, but for all July and August, we've been going through the book of Acts as though we're learning to live out the book of Acts and write our own 29th chapter. And we're writing that individually. The Spirit of God in us is writing chapter 29, but as a church together, we're writing a chapter as well. So it's great to be able to do this with you today. Um, the theme has been living out the book of Acts. And today I want to emphasize how to feast in a famine. It's going to be a lot to do with holding on to three friends that we read about in the scriptures. Faith, hope, and love. When trouble hits, now there's already trouble in the world, uh, but we have, we have the promise of even more troubles. And the end of the age, we read in the Bible, the Bible lays it out really well, that there's going to be troubles. But we can feast in a famine that's the title of my sermon today, How to Feast in a Famine. And when the fertilizer hits the ventilator, when the church holds on to faith and hope and live out the love of God in times of trials and troubles, the world pays attention. Now I'm going to add two more things. During those times of trials, keep the peace. No matter what it costs us, keep the peace. We have a gospel of peace, and we live out the gospel by living out peace, and if we do, we will keep our joy. Nobody can steal your joy as long as you keep the peace of God in your heart. These are spiritual treasures. Lambert, you're an encouragement to me. I hear that you and your mom are thinking of, of maybe making a, a move not far away. And I heard that your first, your first thought was, but we can't move too far away from church. You sitting here every Sunday is an encouragement to me. I thank you for that. I thank you for your, your love for the Lord. How precious are the people of God. How precious. So if we want to feast in a famine, Let's hold on to faith, hope, and love, walk in peace, and keep our joy. Amen. I already wrote the sermon before I got a birthday card from Irene Biddle. Irene did not see my, my sermon notes. 
And when I received her birthday card, the entire card is full of faith, hope, and love, keeping the peace and maintaining your joy. How good is God? How good is God? That's amazing. That's amazing. I love his confirmations like that. And Irene, I thank you for, for your kind and thoughtfulness, but you probably might not have even known you were giving me a card that was the sermon for today. In the book of Acts, we talked about Pentecost and the Spirit of God falling upon 120. Then 120 became 3,000, became another 5,000, and priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, came to the living faith. And 10 years later, we find out that we Gentiles were included. Starting with the House of Cornelius, what an amazing event. First, for the Spirit of God to be given to us, to live within us, and then for God to include the whole world. So now it's true that God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. But I told you last week that there was a backstory that in the background, in Acts eleven twenty eight, the Spirit predicted that there would be a great dearth throughout the entire world. This happened in the reign of Claudius Caesar. Claudius Caesar actually had five dearths. Now let me define a dearth. It's just one of those old fashioned English words, but it means a life threatening scarcity. Usually it could be a natural phenomenon, it could be man-made, uh, I'm going to take you back to the patriarchs today because a life-threatening scarcity or lack in, in those days always meant a drought, a famine, a life-threatening scarcity of water and food, and usually that, that involves a scarcity in the economy, the economy going bad. And five times it happened in Claudius Caesar's reign. You see, Rome was good at winning wars, and wars are expensive. So the money at that time was devoted toward war, not on developing other things. We have that situation today. So I, I saw a great parallel between what's happening in our world today and what's happened back in Scripture and the scripture is alive. It's a living word. So we, we get a look at some of our challenges today, and I just wrote down uh, some people who have had comments about our economy and our world today. You remember Alan Greenspan, for 19 years, he ran the Federal Reserve. And he is, he's 96 today. Now, I'm not sure if he's still living, but when I Googled his name up, it said 96. So I'm assuming he's 96 today, but he's talking like the economy is a house of cards and not, and ready to fall. But I looked up the top 20 economists in America headed by Andrew Schlepper. He is the head of the Department of Economics. He's the chair of the Department of Economics at Harvard University and 19 other economists, usually chairing their respective universities' Department of Economics. They, and you might remember Larry Kudlow, uh, during the Trump administration, he was the economic advisor He's a brilliant man when it comes to the economy. He and the 20 economists 
are saying, get ready. There's a house of cards ready to fall. You got to pay your bills one day. Warren Buffett, one of the many investors in this country, is saying the same thing. And these people are positioning themselves as are the Fortune 500 corporations and many companies throughout the United States. You might notice that CVS pharmacies are closing here and there, and they have a systematic way of closing down pharmacies, Walgreens, Rite Aid in Hammett is gone. So people's business plan there, it's been changing because they see what's coming. But here's my favorite. My favorite is Kevin Gotts. Earl's son, Kevin, is a financial planner. He really gets money, markets, economies. So I called him, I got a letter from him this is a, a newsletter he sent out to many of his people who invest with him. I have 12 or 15 copies up here. This will give you numbers that will scare you. But he's not a fatalist. He says, we'll always find a way to make it. He's not a chicken little sky is falling. He is, if the sky falls, uh, God will make a way for us to feast in a famine. And so he... I invite you to look at these numbers and then to, with today's sermon in mind and keep the hope. He says this, the United States is falling into debt one trillion dollars every 100 days. That's pretty scary. He says all the recent administrations have increased the national debt. During the Clinton administration, they talked about a bu budget surplus, but the debt increased to 4 .4 from 4.4 trillion to 5.8 trillion. During the Bush administration, it gained to another 11.9 trillion. During Barack Obama's administration, the debt was called by him criminal, but it increased to a total of $20.2 trillion. During the Trump administration, add $8 trillion more to that. And during the Biden administration, it has taken a quantum leap. Nobody is guilt-free. That's the term, Kevin. Nobody is guilt-free. We've all had a hand in this national debt. Now, let me encourage you that in the Bible, God talks about the patriarchs. So I'm going to jump from the book of Acts and the dirt that's there, and I'm going to take you back to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because each of them had a famine in their day. They each had a drought, a famine, an economic collapse. But remember this. God was always with them. Despite, despite the tragedy, God had a way of bringing all of our, our forefathers into a safe place. Now in Abraham's case, he said, go to Egypt, go down to Egypt. You'll find relief there. That was how, that was what God told Abraham, go to Egypt. And then to Jacob, Jacob, God says, take your 12 sons, go to, go to Egypt. Take your whole household, there's grain, there's food in Egypt. And of course, you know the story. He sent Joseph ahead as a slave. And Joseph who was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery in Egypt, imprisoned, falsely accused, interpreted Pharaoh's dream, 
and kept the peace and retained his joy, there wasn't one, there's not one word that Joseph ever complained about his fate. Yet he had every right to complain, we would think, but he did not complain. He did not blame. He kept the peace. He retained his joy. And God used him during a worldwide drought and famine to save not only his father Jacob and his brothers and to make peace and forgive his brothers for what he did. I mean, that's deep into peace. But he did it because he knew that God had a higher purpose than his brothers. What you meant for evil, he told his brothers, God meant for good. So look up, see the plan of God, no matter what happens. So in Genesis 26, we have an account. It says in verse one, and there was a famine in the land, like the first famine in the days of Abraham. Now this is the, this is the famine in the days of Isaac. Abraham, go to Egypt. Jacob, go to Egypt. But Isaac, the Lord said and appeared to him and said, stay in this land, the land of the Philistines. Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in this land because I'm going to give you instruction. Then I'm going to give you and your seeds, your descendants after you, I'm going to give you this land. Like I promised Abraham before, I am now promising you. Now here's what God says. This is what you need, no matter what happens in life. One, it says, I will be with you. That's his first promise. If you have God with you, the second promise is easy. Second promise is, I will bless you. I will be with you and I will bless you. Folks, that's what we need no matter what happens around us in this crazy world. And the world is crazy, but you're not. Keep the peace. Don't give you joy away. And hold on to faith in God. Hope always wins out. And love will make a difference. You know, when Moses was told by God to take, take these rebels and go into the wilderness, he only had one request. Remember his request? I'll go if you go. If you go, I'll go. So wise. Well, in this famine in the days of Isaac, God says, stay here. I'm here, I'll be with you, I will bless you, I will give you and your seeds, all your descendants, all of these countries. I'll perform or fulfill my oath, my promise, which I swore to Abraham, your father. Now, when Abraham went to Egypt, I don't know if Isaac went with him. He might not have been born at that time, I don't know. But for sure, Abraham taught Isaac. And he taught him some lessons about obeying God, having the presence of God, having the blessings of God. That's really all you need. The lessons are that obedience will bring benefits. The greatest benefit is that God will be with you in times of trouble. With his presence come his blessings. The greatest blessing of all is God himself. That's priority one. And in Isaac's case, God showed him that God was going to rewrite human history and include him in it, and he will be part of the lineage that leads to the coming and the Messiah. Amen. I'll make your seed multiply, God says, as the stars of the heaven. In your seed, all the nations, all the families of the world will be blessed. Hold on to that thought, because that's what he said to Abraham. Why? Now this is Genesis 26, 4 through 8. Why? 
He says, because your father Abraham obeyed my commandments and followed my statutes. He did, he obeyed exactly what he said. And for Abraham's sake, I'm passing on all these benefits and blessings to you, Isaac. And he'll make that same promise to Jacob. <laughs> if I can refresh your memory, Back in Genesis 12, God said to Abram, now remember, he said, I'm gonna do all this for you, but it all started with your father, Abraham. But while he was still Abram in Ur of the Chaldees, God said, leave your country. This is Genesis 12. Leave your country, your family, and your father, and go to a land but I'm gonna give you instruction. I'll lead you where I want you. I think this was Abraham's first test of faith. Well, he's Abram right now. That was his first test of faith. Would he do this amazing thing to pick up and leave everything behind, including his family and his household? That's faith. He says, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you because I'll be with you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing to the families of the earth and I will bless those who bless you and your descendants. But I will curse those who curse you and your descendants. Now keep in mind, Abram was a Chaldean. There was no nation called Israel. There was no Jewish people, Rabbi, at this time. He took, it looks like he took a Gentile. And through this Chaldean, he's going to change human history and he's going to form a nation for himself and form a people for him to love. And then through that nation, Israel, now, this is the promise God made to Abraham. This is the promise he's making to Isaac. He said, I'll not just give you the land of Canaan. He says, I'm gonna cause you to be a blessing to everyone, every family, and every nation. See, God just honors faith. Remember in Hebrew eleven six, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because first you have to believe God exists and then you have to be diligent to pursue him. God blesses that kind of diligence. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had that kind of diligence. See, God uses our faith to reveal himself through us to the world around us. True blessings come from being obedient to the covenant. So Israel is going to make these contributions to the world. There's been no nation like Israel. The United States has been greatly blessed, of course. The United States has founded a nation on the gospel of Jesus and even wrote our constitution by using the Bible as a reference. But there's been no nation like Israel, small, they have contributed to the world in science, medicine, technology, irrigation, crops, literature. Their irrigation system is second to none and they have taught the world how to irrigate in a way the world didn't know how to irrigate before. And as far as crops go, 90% of all the fruit in the Mediterranean area, around the Mediterranean Sea, 90% of it comes from Israel. Israel has blessed the world with Nobel Peace Prize winners in chemistry, economics, world peace, and literature.
Maybe some of the most famous Nobel Prize winners would be Albert Einstein and Mother Teresa. I think Mother Teresa was from a, a, a country in Europe. However, per capita, Israel has had the most Nobel Peace Prize winners per capita than any other country. When I was in Israel with John Somerville, uh, we went to a hospital and the hospital has a wing and the wing uh, is like a, a hotel. They bring mothers and fathers around the world to this hospital hotel with their infants and they do the most precise heart surgery on even little infants. John Somerville met a Dr. Ami Cohen. Dr. Ami Cohen is a heart specialist and while he was alive, he, he's, he's passed away today, but while he was alive, he started a ministry called Save a Child's Heart. And he would operate on little Israeli infants and babies. But then he ran out of customers. So he said, let's clandestinely, let's sneak Arabic babies across the border and we'll bring their parents and, and it will cost them nothing. And he began to operate on Arabic. I mean, these are, these are people that have sworn hostility to the Jews. But he would save a child's heart, no matter who that child was. And when he died, doctors and nurses kept his ministry alive, and they now send out doctors around the world to teach other doctors in their country. And yet at the same time, they bring in infants from all around the world, free of charge. Parents stay there free. And they save a child's heart. How many have heard about the GPS program Waze? W-A-Z-E, Waze. Do you know that started in Israel? There was an owner of a company, a technology company, and, and they developed, he, with their 50 employees, developed a GPS that would reroute you by telling you where the traffic is ahead of you so you can be rerouted around the traffic and it's up to the minute data. Google bought them out for a billion dollars. Google bought Waves. You know what the owner did? He gave each of his 50 employees one million dollars and the instruction. Now you go out and bless the world. There's never been a nation quite like Israel. And God kept his promise. Through you, I will bless all the nations. Now, let's go back to Isaac. Did you think I forgot? <laughs> then Isaac, not in verse 12, <clears throat> Isaac sowed in the land and received in that same year 100-fold. That is everything he invested in a famine. He got a return of 100 fold. It might have been livestock. It might have been uh, crops. It might have been vineyards. But everything Isaac put his hand to in the middle of a famine <clears throat> during scarcity in life, God blessed him and increased it 100 fold. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's hard to sow when you have very little. And it's hard to sow in a famine.
Lots of people go through their own individual famines. Uh, when we were pastoring in Israel, we would take the entire month of August off. One month, <clears throat> I went up to Seattle. Uh, my friend, Pastor Doug Heck, pastored Horizon Church in Seattle, downtown Seattle, right by the Space Needle. <clears throat> and uh, we were up there for a couple weeks, and the first Sunday that we were there, um, I, 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 I kind of got reacquainted with their youth. They sent seven youth on a mission uh, to Cabo, and they had a great time. I mean, it was just over the top. So we got to visit all those seven young people, including Caleb. <clears throat> uh, Caleb was a young guy. Uh, he had just tons and tons of energy. His mother, Mary, uh, attended church, and Caleb was sitting with his mother. And after church, I made a beeline right to Caleb. And he introduced me to his mother, and introduced us to his mother. And his mom would talk about, <clears throat> she talked about uh, needing a job. She says, I, I've got my applications out many places, but I, I need a job. And um, she also mentioned about uh, her sister. She and her sister have been estranged for a long time. She didn't say what the problem was. But we had a nice conversation, the four of us, and then I kind of drifted away and talked to someone else. And as I was talking to someone else, the Spirit of God, He didn't say in so many words, He put a strong impression on me. Ask her, go back and ask Mary to give you one dollar. Lord, what's, okay, what's a dollar? But I did, I went back and I said, Mary, would you be willing to give me a dollar? Without any hesitation, she opened her purse, pulled out a dollar and gave it to me. <laughs> now it says, if you bless a good man, you'll get a good man's reward. The Bible also says, if you bless a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. But it just says, give and it shall be given to you. We left, a week later, we're back in church, and here's what she told us. She, she sought us out immediately <clears throat> and said, during this past week, I watched my mother and father's home when they went on vacation. My sister called, and she came over to watch the home with me. And we reconciled during this week, and my sister and I are closer together than we've ever been. We love each other like we did years ago. <clears throat> and she said, I got three job offers this week. The first was good, the second was better, the third was my dream job, and it paid good. She said, you don't know this, but I was down to four dollars when you asked me for a dollar. If you sow in a family, and if God leads you to do this, don't be surprised if God will increase and multiply your giving. <clears throat> now it says of Isaac, let's go back, let's go back to the ranch. It says God made him great. He was wealthy and he grew and grew until God made him even more great. <clears throat> he was greater than anyone in the land, including the king of the Philistines, King Abimelech. Now, <clears throat> because he was so great, the king goes to Isaac and says, you're greater than all of us, so leave this territory. So Isaac goes to the other side of Gerer into a valley and things begin to happen. First, the wells that his father Abraham left him got stopped up by the Philistines. You know, when you stop someone's well and you cut off their water supply, you're playing a life and death game. But Isaac instructed his herdsmen and his servants 
Do not go to war. Do not fight over the well. And so he goes over to the valley at the recommendation of Kim, King Abimelech. He goes over into the valley and he takes another well. And the herdsmen, the Philistine herdsmen, claim that well as their own. I think that's where we get the term claim jumper. So they jumped his claim. He moved on. And he drilled another well. And he found water. And the herdsmen claimed that one too. It was the fourth well that he dug. God kept leading him to water each and every time. The fourth well was his. And then the Bible says, and he was fruitful in all the land. He was home and he had his water. God kept blessing him. He kept the peace. And here's what happened. Because he kept the peace, because he retained his joy, because he was a man of faith, hope, and love, the king, King Abimelech, comes to him with the captain of the army. You know, the king always travels with security. And he takes the captain of the army, Fichel is his name, And he says to Isaac, you are greater than all of us and we can see the good hand of God blessing you and everything you put your hand to, your God is with you. So they sit down and they have a covenant meal together. And then after the meal, the following day, they make peace with one another. Actually, the king wants in on the covenant, or at least the blessings of the covenant that Isaac has with God. This is amazing to me, but this is a lesson that I took away and I never forgot it. God will use our faith, hope, and love. And if we'll keep the peace and maintain the joy, and the world around us sees that, when the world sees it, they will say, we want your God. We want the covenant that God has with you. I want in on the good things of God. Now, I'm going to close with a reference back to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and, Pri Paul and Silas they're preaching in the Gentile world, in a certain city, and they're beaten up. I mean, they just don't reject his message. They, they give Paul and Silas a good be. And then they order that he be taken to the prison and be, they, be, they be put in the lowest dungeon part of the, the inner stock. So here they are, probably a third story down, two stories above them is the normal prison. But when you don't want people to escape, you put them down in the lowest prison where, the, where it's dark and damp and dank and the floor and it's musty. And they put them in stocks. I imagine they're sitting against a a brick wall and their hands are in stocks against the wall and then their ankles are in stocks and the stocks are attached to the floor and the wall and it says at midnight Paul and Silas began to pray and then they sang praises to the Lord after all that day They're beaten, they're bloody, they're tired, and yet at midnight, in a prison, in the worst conditions, they pray and they sang praises to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him 
all creatures here below, praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And God shakes the prison with an earthquake. And their stocks fall off. And they go back into the innermost dark part of the cave. The jailer comes. Listen, the only job that jailer has is to make sure nobody gets away because if they do, he's a dead man. So the jailer comes and he sees the stocks empty and no prisoner. He takes out his sword and he puts the tip of the sword over his heart. And Paul and Silas see what he's about to do. And they said, stop, do yourself no harm. We're still your prisoner. We're still here. And the jailer said these amazing words. What must I do to have faith like that? What must I do to have your kind of hope? What must I do to have the love of God that you have? And they said, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus this night. And not just you, but God is ready to save your entire family. The jailer takes them home and he washes the blood, the dried blood off their body. Gives them a fresh meal. And that night, the jailer and his family come to Jesus. Keep the peace and you'll keep your joy. And even if you're thrown into a, a dark, dank dungeon, let your faith, let your hope, let your love be known no matter what the circumstances in life are. And the world around you will pay attention. With that, I'll conclude our summer's walk through the book of Acts. Amen. Rabbi, if you would be so kind as to close us out in a song of praise. Keep Paul and Silas in mind as we sing this last song.